Sean. Um, I didn't realize that I was on Google, so I go and Google myself to find out now what they say. Um, all right, I'll hold on to this. It's really quite an honor to be here at the um, Australian Institute of International Affairs. Um, you are world renowned. Um, I've heard of you and I've read your articles in the Caribbean, and um, I just want to commend you for the work that you're doing. And I'd like to thank you for having me here tonight. Um, so, my topic is on small island developing states and sustainable development. And I'm going to be addressing the notion that small island developing states are a special case in international in sustainable development. Mm. Now I should say that um, even though the, um, the press sometimes speaks of, of the relationship between Australia and the Pacific Islands, it's not always a dire as it comes from the media. And um, I saw a different perspective in New York where Australia was quite a partner for the small island development states. So, sustainable development. Sustainable development is the pursuit of economic development while ensuring that environmental preservation and social advancement are not hindered. It is also technically the pursuit of environmental preservation without hindering economic development or social advancement. And similarly, promoting social advancement without hindering economic development and environmental preservation. Now I say this because each, each pillar has equal standing. And you need to have these three pillars working in concert to, to have sustainable development taking place. It's not just environment, it's not just economic, it's not just social. And you also need to ensure that it's taking place for the present generation and for future generations. So that, you know, um, in a nutshell, is where sustainable development comes in. Now, small island development states, they're considered a special case in sustainable de development because they have particular challenges um, in meeting these, these goals and targets. The challenges are structural. They are based on sometimes the the challenges they have in implementation, and they're also based on um, really just um, different vulnerabilities that they're experiencing. And as you see here on the on the screen, these are the small island developing states. Now, this list comes from the Department of Economic and Social Affairs from the UN. Um, I've used this list as opposed to others because the sustainable development agenda is covered by the Department of Economic and Social Affairs. So these are the islands, as you see, scattered around the world that are covered um, and fall on the realm of small island development states. Now, this presentation then will look at um, the global sustainable development process. I'll also look at small island development states and their process, how they came to be considered within the UN and within the international community. But I also want to address the idea that they have had significant impacts on the international community, on the whole sustainable development discussion. Now, this is due in part to the challenges that they've experienced. Um, I also want to look at the way Australia has assisted small island development states and also to show the international support forces and also look at the way forward. Where are we now in 2016 and where do we go in this current 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Now the evolution of uh, the sustainable development process. Many people look at the Earth Summit in 1992 as the beginning of the sustainable development discussion. However, I like to go 20 years earlier and really get a sense of what was happening. Why did we come to that 1992 environment and economic um, marriage. And so, I go all the way back to 1972 and the UN Conference on the Human Environment. Now this took place at quite an important time within the international community. The 1960s was known as the UN Development Decade. And um, this was a period where industrialization, where um, mining, construction, and economic growth were 
the priority areas. And um, many countries um, in the developing world um, were focused on the parameters of success that the developed countries had. So you had industrialization, technology, the development of technology. In the midst of this, you have the UN Conference on the Human Environment. And the idea behind this was that the industrialization and the technology development that was taking place were not kind to the environment. And so where do we go from here? Because if you continue down this track, the human environment, as they call it, will be impacted negatively. This was not, um, not viewed very kindly by or very favorably by many countries, developed and developing, because well, what do they do? How do you then pursue economic development if you're saying that what you're doing does not help the development of <coughs> the um, environment process? And so, this was a statement by the head of delegation to the UN General Assembly in 1972. And he said, the special needs of developing countries should be kept clearly in view and should not be submerged in any campaign for environmental perfectionism, which, however well-intentioned, the developing countries simply cannot afford. Now this is a typical sentiment in 1972 amidst the UN Conference on the Human Environment. They didn't want to hear about environmental preservation. But you notice on the, the second paragraph that he speaks of the peaceful use of the seabed and the ocean floor. And that will come into you know, much more focus as we go on. And so we go back to um, the, you know, the global sustainable development process. Because of the sentiments in 1972, it took 20 years before the global community could find a way to merge environmental preservation and economic development. And this was at the, um, the 1992 Earth Summit. But before that, you had the establishment of the Brundtland Commission in 1983, which really, there was all this sentiment about the human, the um, Conference on Human Environment. And so the sense is, well, what do we do? Because there's one side saying we need economic growth, and the other side saying we need environmental preservation. What do we do? So the Brundtland Commission was established in 1983 for that specific purpose. How do we find a way through this? It took them four years to release the Brundtland Report called Our Common Future. And the idea behind this was, all right, we've just listened to all of it, the, um, the debate. How do we bring them together? And um, well, it was successful in that countries decided we're going to have the Earth Summit, the UN Conference on the Environment and Development. And uh, as you see, in um, 1992, this conference took place, and it spoke of the integration of environment and development concerns, and greater attention to them will lead to the fulfillment of basic needs, improved living standards for all, better protected and managed ecosystems, and a safer, more prosperous future. Now I should say that even though the UN Conference on the Human Environment did take a bit of a hit in that it challenged, let's say, um, industrialization and um, technological development, that was actually not the case because it did mention that one of the reasons for underdevelopment, or underdevelopment has impacted um, environmental degradation. And so this was something that we need to find a way to bring environmental preservation with economic um, progress. And so we had the UN conference, um, sorry, we had the UN conference on environment and development in 1992. And this was really that first time where, okay, the sustainable development debate is now a part of the global discussion. And so following that, we had, um, the UN Conference, the World Summit on Sustainable Development in 2002, and then the UN Conference on Sustainable Development in 2012. Now I should say that there were different processes taking place at the time. So even though you had the UN Conference um, 
on sustainable development, or the World Summit, sorry, in 2002. He also had the Millennium Development Goals taking place in 2000. He also had the Financing for Development Conference that took place also in 2002. And so right now, on paper, these processes were supposed to complement each other, but they didn't. Um, they, were, they remained three separate processes taking place. And so the climate change discussion didn't always take into account what was happening in the Millennium Development Goals discussion, and also didn't take into account the Financing for Development discussion. And so you needed to find a way to, to merge these processes, because it became a stretch on many developing countries, and in particular, small land developing states. Um, for many small island developing states, they have one person covering the implementation process of these, um, the implement, implementation of these three processes. So it's a bit of a strain on this, these limited resources in the islands. And it also explained why the UN Conference on Sustainable Development and the Sustainable Development Goals are so important, because they really sought to bring all of the processes together and say, okay, how do we go forward? Let's take all of this forward on the one um, process, on the one implementation exercise. Now, I should say with the sustainable development goals, they are universal. It is not a developing um, country dynamic. It actually applies to all countries. Um, one of the major challenges with global processes is the implementation at the local level. The sustainable development goals sought to come with 169 targets to say, all right, whereas poverty eradication may not be the priority area of a developed country, but if you look at it within the country, is everyone in that country at the level they should be? And so how do we then ensure that every Australian, for example, has access to the best quality education, to the best quality health care, how do we ensure that every Australian has decent jobs um, and all of the different targets and goals that are mentioned? And so that is why the sustainable development goals are very significant to all countries at a local level, at a regional level, and at a global level. Now, having said all of that, we come now to small island development states. And I'll give a brief um, background as well to small island development. Coincidentally, it was also 1972 where small island developing states, or island developing states, were first mentioned. Um, and that was at the UN Conference on Trade and Development um, at their third session in, in Quito. And um, at this meeting in 1972, basically, it was felt that island developing states are facing challenges in economic development because they are they have communication and transportation challenges based on the fact that they're so remote. They're far away from the major met um, metropolitan areas, uh, from the major industrial areas. And so how do we ensure that these island nations, and it at the time included Sri Lanka, it, it included Madagascar, it included um, the Philippines, because these are all island developing nations. Um, there were not that many small island development states that were independent at the time, there were a few. 1972 conference um, brought the, the, the challenge of island developing countries to the fore. Um, this was followed by 1974 UN res uh, resolution 3338 on island developing states. Now, this was the first UN resolution, the first time that there was any mention of island developing states, where there was a focus on the issues impacting island developing states. And within this, um, this, re this resolution, there was a call for further analysis, further assessment, what is troubling the island developing states, how do we help them? How do we ensure at the time their communication and transportation challenges are addressed? Um, there was a report of a panel of experts that, that took place that same year um, and this came out of the UNCTAD uh, meeting. And this report basically showed the challenges that they have. And within that report, there was a special section on small island developing states. And so they realized that even though all of the developing island developing states had a challenge, 
small island developers face a even greater challenge. Um, and within that assessment, they looked at the economic challenges, but it also looked at the environmental challenges that they were facing. Um, it looked at the fact that when a disaster struck, these small island developers faced then basically were set back by several years, perhaps decades. And so the question was, how do we address the economic issues, but also ensure that if um, a disaster strikes, they are still able to have economic growth. Um, and so this was in 1974. In 1983, the Non-Aligned Movement met to discuss um, small island developing countries. It happened in Grenada in 1983. Now, these dates are significant because if you look at what I, the previous slide showed, there was a sustainable development process that's taking place and different events that are taking place in 1972, in 1983, in 1987. But here at the other end of the spectrum, there are issues taking place within the small island development states that it's a separate process taking place. And so in 1983, following that now meeting, the idea of disaster mitigation, you know, um, strengthening the island's resilience to disasters to help their economic development, that started to be discussed. And so within the islands, there was a sense of merging, the merging of the issues of economic development and environmental preservation. And it was also mentioned within these discussions on the ocean. How do you harness the ocean? How do you um, utilize the fact that the ocean is there? Is it an inhibitor to development? How can we, as the international community, address the concerns that the islands are having because they are remote within the ocean? In 1987, there was a resolution, a UN resolution, that took place on disaster recovery in islands. This was tabled by the Maldives. The Maldives had just had um, a storm that devastated the islands. They wanted, you know, to have international support. And so we have this resolution on disaster recovery. They took it to the UN, they took it to every global entity they could find, and they also took it to the Commonwealth. And that Commonwealth Heads meeting called for the Small States Forum on Sea Level Rise in 1989. And this also, this took place in the Maldives as well. So the Maldives was very instrumental in bringing all of the different islands together to discuss um, issues that were important to them. And it was um, significant, this Maldives meeting, because they started to get a sense that, all right, rather than addressing our concerns individually, how do we then start coordinating our, our approach? How do we look at it as these are the concerns of this group of countries? And so it was that Maldives meeting that really was the impetus for a change in the sustainable development discussion, but also a change in the small island development state discussion. And in 1990, during negotiations on environmental preservation, the Alliance of Small Island States was created. And um, it, was, it brought together all of the island nations that were in the UN to coordinate their, their strategies within that UN um, discussion. And so EOSIS now became a very powerful entity because they really mobilized, they really ensured that every discussion that took place, their concerns were addressed. And it was EOSIS that ensured that paragraph 17G occurred in the Earth Summit. And it was here where you found what are the challenges affecting small and developing states. And so this was significant because now there was no mention of islands in the UN conference on the human environment. There's no mention of islands in the Brundtland report small island developing states, there was no mention of them. But now the processes have come together. So not only is the environment and the development taking place, but you have the small island developing states taking place. And what EOSIS did was that they didn't just look at their issues. They said, all right, our issues are global issues. 
they started trying to influence the entire sustainable development discussion. And so much of the of Agenda 21, a lot of the, the, the sense of, all right, where do we go in terms of environmental preservation? Where do we go in terms of economic development as a challenge? AOSIS, right? They are making interventions, trying to ensure that their concerns were met and that their concerns were not only island concerns, but global concerns. Following the Earth Summit, there was the Global Conference on the Sustainable Development of Small Island Developing States, or SIDS, as we call them. And this took place in 1994 in Barbados. It was the first meeting that addressed the implementation of the outcomes of the Earth Summit. And so this was also very significant because it is here now we are at the Earth Summit has been adopted. What do we need to implement? And a lot of the, the discussion took place at that Barbados conference. Um, following that conference, there were two more global conferences on small island developing states, one in Mauritius in 2005, and the third international conference on SIDS in Samoa in 2014. So we've had a brief background on the sustainable development and the SIDS process. But what's the, what so important about it's why they consider a special case. And you see in the document, the, the um, paragraph in Agenda 21, I rushed through it, but here are the challenges. They have structural challenges because they have, they have their small size. They're small in size, they have small population, they have limited resource base, they are distant from the major economic hubs. So these are structural challenges in that you can't make them any bigger they're not going to move any closer to the major metropolitan areas. Um, their populations are still limited. And so these are structural challenges that were inhibiting um, their sustainable development implementation. They were also vulnerable to the economic fluctuations that were taking place. So when you have the global economic and um, financial crisis, because they're small open economies, they're greatly impacted by this. Um, we also have environmental challenges. So a hurricane goes through. If a hurricane, well, hurricanes don't hit Australia, thankfully, but um, cyclones. Right. So there you go. So the cyclones hit, but it's not hitting all of Australia. It's right. hitting one one state, one one, you know. But if it hits the Pacific, it hits the Pacific island. It's hitting the entire island, and so they really don't have anywhere to run if it hits. And so. Um, these are the, the vulnerabilities that they face. Um, and of course, climate change and sea level rise. And because of their small size, small population, limited resource space, they have limited economic options. They're not that many economic activities that take place on the islands. And um, because of that, you have unemployment, you have migration. And so these are also hindering the economic development. But the thing about the islands is that because they're remote, they have unique flora and fauna, and they have their unique cultures and traditions that are found nowhere else on the planet. I can tell you, um, in the Caribbean, there are three islands, um, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, and Grenada, and each one has a parrot. And this parrot, you can find it only on that island. And these parrots are actually like cousins to each other. But the one in St. Vincent, you will not find it in St. Lucia, you will not find it in Grenada, and they're not found anywhere else on this planet. And these are similar traits within the Pacific Island, within the Indian Ocean Islands, within the Atlantic Ocean Islands. And so, there's a sense of this flora and fauna is so unique that we need to find ways to preserve them. And so, what we're saying is that international assistance is needed. Now, um, looking at the special case of SIDS, we know that there are challenges. This year alone, you saw evidence of the challenges. You saw Fiji got hit with one of the worst um, storms on record. Um, at the same time, there are several Pacific Islands that had one of the worst droughts on record. Um, coral bleach, um, not coral bleach, uh, the coral reef has been bleaching um, throughout many of the tropical islands. And in the Caribbean, there have also been quite um, severe droughts this year. Now these are, these are happening on islands that are still recovering from the global economic and financial crisis. 
And so how do these countries then ensure that they implement sustainable development strategies when they're still trying to deal with, with, with storms and, and droughts and, um, and high debt? And so this is why there is what we call the special case of SIDS and why international assistance is needed. Now, when looking at the sustainable development of SIDS, we've had three conferences. And the most recent conference, the Samoa Conference, produced the Samoa Pathway. And these are the themes or the priority areas for the islands. And as you can see from this list, it's not just environmental. We have economic, we have social, we have environmental. And you see with economic growth, they mentioned sustainable tourism. And the sustainable tourism in terms of uh, because tourism right now is one of the major industries in many of the islands. And so how do we ensure that the tourism that takes place doesn't damage the environment? How do we ensure that they, the working class, the workers in tourism in the islands are not taken advantage of? Um, how do we ensure that this is tourism that is happening now, and 10 years from now, the islands are still there to ensure that tourists can come and enjoy them? And so that is why they have that special reference to sustainable tourism. Um, and you also see there's health and non-communicable diseases because these are major challenges in the islands. You have social development, you also have the biodiversity and invasive alien species. The small pack will also produce tools or the means of implementation. And um, as you see here, the small pack is full of partnerships. And the idea behind why those partnerships given such a, um, a priority focus? Because rather than looking at it in terms of aid, international support, it's looking at it as this is a partnership. We're working together to help the islands. But in helping the islands, we're also helping ourselves. We're also looking at um, any area of, of sustainable development where Australia can benefit, and the islands can benefit. And so this is the partnership that they speak of. And of course, you have financing, trade, capacity building, technology, data and statistics, institutional support, monitoring, and accountability. So these were all the areas that they felt were necessary, the tools that were necessary to ensure that implementation was successful and that the sustainable development of SIDS can take place. Now, what is the impact of small island development states in the sustainable development agenda. Because you don't, they said didn't want to just be viewed as the victims. They didn't want to just be viewed as, all right, we're special cases and we're there. But they also had quite an impact on the sustainable development discourse. The Barbados Conference, as I mentioned, was the first example of implementation of Agenda 21. You look at climate change. Now, climate change was the area of the greatest advocacy. Climate change, the small island developing states focused on climate change because they saw it as an existential threat. They saw that if climate change were allowed to continue, many of the islands would disappear. And so they started really focusing on climate change and addressing it. And so in 2005, during the Mauritius conference, there was a move to weaken the language on climate action. And the then ambassador of Tuvalu, for example, he refused to budge on his position that no, we need to ensure that climate action is as strong as it could be. Now that ambassador is now the <coughs> president of Tuvalu, and he has maintained that very strong position of climate action is needed. Um, the Maldives, again, come to the Maldives. The Maldives held um, parliament underwater. And you know, this was recorded and sent around the world to show this is what will happen to everyone, not just the Maldives, if we don't address climate change. Um, this is what will happen if climate inaction continues. And yes, it was a publicity stunt, but it hammered home the point that these are the impacts. This is what can happen. Um, when you look at climate change, they also are very strong in advocating for the 1.5% um, degree limit. In the lead up to Copenhagen, that was the 
the, the point, 1.5. Um, they actually had a slogan saying 1.5 to stay alive. And, um, and this was to, there were many countries that really felt that's not going to happen. I can tell you, um, I was at a meeting with, with another delegation that looked at us and said, well, do you have a plan B? Because that's not going to fly. Which we said, no, we don't have a plan B. Our plan, A, B, C, and D is 1.5. So, in 2000, in fact, this year, the Secretary General met with the Alliance of Small Island States and said to them, well, listen, your stance really changed history because there were so many countries that were determined, nope, we're going to stick with two, two degrees, but now, with the Paris outcome, you see that 1.5 that's there. So, we didn't have a plan B, but at least, you know, Plan A was able to remain in there when many countries at the time didn't want it to go below two degrees. Um, there was also a climate change. There was a Security Council meeting that addressed the security implications of climate change. And this took place in 2011. And this took place much to the, the consternation of many countries, many Security Council members who felt climate change is not a security Council matter, but with the idea of climate refugees and the legal impl um, implications and the social implications and the security implications, suddenly it, it became clearer that if you don't address climate change, these are the other matters that will take place. But I can tell you at the time there was so much resistance to the very fact that you're not taking this into the Security Council. Um, and so it was quite um, an accomplishment to take this there because now suddenly international peace and security for well, climate change is not this environmental issue. Um, and so these were areas where um, the small island developing states made that impact within the discussion on climate change. Um, since the Paris Agreement, uh, many islands have not rested on their laurels. They have decided, okay, fine, We've adopted it, but now what? Because the challenge, of course, is where do we go from, um, from the adoption to implementation? And so um, Fiji was the first country that indicated we're going to um, not just sign, but ratify. The Marshall Islands was the third country that said we're not just going to sign, we're going to ratify, and we're going to lead from the front on climate action. Um, these are commendable um, pursuits. In the Caribbean, many of their national development plans incorporated um, the Paris outcome. And so there's a sense of, because of our, our national development is so tied to climate change and the impact of climate change, they have to be part of the whole national sustainable development, um, the national development agenda. Um, and in the Pacific, there's an initiative called the Pacific Rising Initiative, which is sort of like a national plan for climate change, for climate action. And so this is something that if the Pacific Islands are successful in, in promoting, this is something that will be replicated, that has the potential to be replicated around the world. So these are the actions that the small island developing states have been pursuing with respect to climate change. Um, now the Security Council meeting, I mentioned the 2011 one, Last year, there was another meeting um, in the Security Council discussing small island development states. And this was really where the evolution of sustainable development came to its, its, its highest point. Because sustainable de development was now seen as integral to peace and security. And peace and security was seen as integral to sustainable development. And so this meeting at the Security Council was, was just the height of where sustainable development can go. And this was all due to the actions of the small island development states, the sustainable development goals. Now, of course, all of the goals are important to the islands, but there were two goals in particular that the small island development states felt were of priority areas. They were Goal 13 on climate change, and goal 14 on oceans and seas. And there are many delegations and UN agencies that are convinced 
that these two goals would not be sustainable development goals if not for the small island developing states. Again, there was much um, consternation, much um, rolling of eyes when the SIDS mentioned climate change and oceans, but they're there now because the, the global community understood that if you don't address climate change and you don't look after the oceans and the seas, well, sustainable development is not going to happen. And next year, 2017, there's a, going to be a global conference on oceans in Fiji. And this meeting was due to the hard work of the Pacific small island development states, and Fiji in particular. And they felt that the oceans is not just an island issue, but it's a global issue. We're all connected to the ocean. And we've basically come full circle, because in 1972, there was this mention of the oceans in 1992, small island developing states, their inclusion in, a, in Agenda 21 was within the oceans paragraph. So here we are now where <coughs> oceans and seas are being led by small island developing states. Now international support to the islands. Now we know that the islands need assistance to address their sustainable development challenges. Um, as we see from the paragraph, it's saying really that small island developing states will be constrained in meeting these challenges without the cooperation and assistance of the international, international community. And that is where Australia comes in, because Australia has been a true partner to the islands from the very beginning. In that 1989 small state forum, meeting in the Maldives, it was Australia that provided the funding for this meeting to take place. And um, there was an academic, Professor G.W. Lennon of Flinders University of South Australia, who provided a paper on this, um, for this forum. The chair of the first international conference on small island developing states in Barbados was Penelope Ann Wensley. She was um, one of your um, career diplomat, she was an ambassador at the time, ambassador of the environment, and she went on to be your governor of Queensland. But she was instrumental in bringing consensus to many of the issues taking place at the time. This was Australia's role in helping the islands. Um, the preparations for the, <coughs> the Samoa conference, Australia again was right there in the midst of the negotiations, ensuring that a lot of the contentious issues, a lot of the, um, the wide-ranging issues where there seemed not to be any, any solution, Australia became that bridge builder. And Australia was the one that said, all right, how do we find a compromise? How do we come with the language and take it forward? They were one of the, the instrumental partners within that process. And they were also one of the, Australia and New Zealand provided financial support, um, administrative support, all types of support to Samoa to make what this meeting in Samoa one of the most successful UN conferences that we've had. Um, in addition to that global support, we've also had Australia providing support to many of the Pacific Islands. Um, there are quite a few projects that are in the Pacific Islands that, whether it's DFAT, whether it's um, different aid agencies in Australia that have provided a lot of support to the Pacific Islands. And so Australia has been a partner to, a partner and an ally to the global process of the small island developing states, but also a regional partner to the Pacific states. In addition to Australia's support, there has been international support to the states. And um, I just have a few points of which, can, which um, activities took place since the Samoa conference. Um, the partnership framework is one of the major um, UN um, activities and brought about multi-stakeholder dialogues, um, just different areas of how can we take the sustainable development of SIDS forward, how can we partner with the SIDS and partner with each other to help the SIDS. There's a high level roundtable on innovative partnerships in SIDS. There was a ministerial meeting on food security and climate action and that was convened in Italy 
and it was a collaboration between the Food and Agriculture Organization and the Department of Economic and Social Affairs, which felt, all right, sustainable agriculture is a critical area for islands, so let's find ways we need to, to address this and ensure that it's not lost in the islands. Um, the High Level Political Forum, which is one of the major UN um, agencies that covers um, the implementation of the Sustainable Development Agenda, is a special segment each year on small island development states. Um, the Interagency Consultative Group on SIDS, it's the UN agencies with many international agencies or regional agencies, so um, the Pacific Island Forum, um, SCAP, different Pacific agencies, different Caribbean agencies, Indian Ocean agencies, collaborating with the UN agencies to find the best strategies to implement this in more pathway. And we have the Lighthouse Initiative, which was an, initi an initiative by the International Renewable Energy Agency that focused on renewable energy in the islands. And this was, um, it took place in 2014 at the Secretary General's um, Climate Change Summit. And so these were some of the activities that took place. Now, having said that, there are still challenges. International cooperation is still not as it should be. There are a few partners, but all of the partners are not there. And all of the outcomes that were agreed upon since 1992 have not taken place. And so, if you look at Agenda 21 in 1992, Agenda 2013 2015, these are the means of implementation. And they are the same means of implementation. If you look at the Barbados Program of Action, the outcome of the Barbados Conference, and the Samoa Pathway. Again, you have the same um, means being called for. Finance, trade, technology transfer, partnerships. And so, perhaps, had they actually implemented these outcomes in, 19, in the 1990s, we would not have needed to call for them in 2014, 2015. And so, it's a sense, really, of international cooperation is just not coming it's just not materializing as it should. And so where do we go from here? Because um, we looked at the means of implementation, which are very important, but more is needed. Um, vulnerability and resilience. And many islands have called on the way forward. We need to address our vulnerabilities. Um, the challenge, of course, is that there have been methodologies developed, but these methodologies have have been more theoretical. And so rather than looking at just the theoretical debate, um, and these methodologies have been developed by the UN, by the UN Conference on Trade and Development, by the Commonwealth Secretariat, and by the University of Malta. And they're all very good. But what you need are practical solutions, practical strategies. You know, you need the resilience built, you need um, the, the seawalls built, you need mechanisms and institutions in place. And so that is what really is required. You also need to look at a global approach. Because one of the challenges we have is, when you look at the sustainable development of SIDS, it's on a regional approach. Countries have looked at it and said, all right, we're going to help our neighbors. Or we're going to help countries that we have a geopolitical significance to us. This doesn't help the, the SIDS process because you then have some wealthier SIDS, some more successful SIDS, and there are others that are just left out of the pool. And so the idea is, we need to move away from that. We're only looking after our neighbors and our friends, but put systems in place. And the thing is, the aid and the projects don't have to be, you know, um, it doesn't have to just be about money. If you put a system in place in, in the Pacific, it's a system that is applicable to the Indian Ocean, to the Atlantic Ocean, to the Caribbean. Similarly, if it's in the Caribbean, it's Africa, black everywhere. And so that's the global approach that we're, we're looking for. Now, you have to also remove the culture of dependency. The culture of dependency is one of the, you will never see this in, in an outcome document, but it's there because so often, the first thing you hear is that, all right, well, you can't function, the sustainable development of SID will not take place unless 
these international schools. And this sentiment starts to trickle down that, all right, well, if we don't get support, all is lost. Now, we've called it since 1972 that small land development states have challenges. They've not had all of the support since 1972, and they've been able to exist, and they've been very resilient. And so that sense of their resilience needs to remain. They don't always need to be told that, all right, you need a great benefactor to, to bail you out of your situation. They have great ideas within the islands themselves, and these are the things that need to be nurtured. We've seen from the Alliance of Small Island States, because they created this among themselves, and it has done great things, not just to the islands, but to the global community. And so this is where you remove the culture of dependency, and you start looking at true partnerships. Now, the hope is, of course, that partnerships will occur. You don't just want the island to be self-sufficient. Well, you do want it to be self-sufficient, but you want partners. You don't just want aid, you don't just want a donor community. You want to ensure that 40 years from now, we're not still saying, well, um, and so this <coughs> online development stage is a special case in sustainable development. What you want to say 40 years from now is, Small island development states are partners in sustainable development and they have something to offer to, to developed countries and developed countries have something to offer to them. And so that is where we are from here. We have to build the, the, um, the private sector. We have to engage with the academics. During the Samoa conference, and I'll end on this, Australia spoke of economic diplomacy spoke of finding ways to build the, the, the private sector to, to focus on entrepreneurship, um, innovation within the islands. And this, I think, is one of the ways that we can go forward because you need that private sector to be developed. You need many of the islands to, to have other options other than a one, one industry. And I think when, when Australia made that point in Samoa, it is something that can be replicated throughout all of the islands. And so not just in the Pacific, because as you understand, my position is a global position. If Australia can engage with all of the islands, the Caribbean, the Indian Ocean, and the um, Atlantic Ocean, it can be to the benefit of Australia, it will be to the benefit of the island, because now you've just developed the private sectors. And so that is the partnerships that we're speaking of. Thank you.